Hey everybody, this is the Anyway Whatever podcast and I'm your host Mike Fisher. Today's guest is John Spanky Stokes of SpankyStokes.com. John is involved in the custom toy um, industry, the custom vinyl toy industry, and um, his website SpankyStokes.com is one of the biggest sites for that stuff. And um, you know, he's his own figure and me and John have been in contact for about six or seven years uh, through that toy industry. and. He's a super cool guy. He's always really positive, funny person. And I was happy to have him on. We had a really cool conversation. And, you know, as always, uh, if you are listening to the audio version, you can find us on anchor.fm and I have Apple iTunes, wherever it is you get your podcast content and uh, give us a subscribe and a five star review if that is what you feel like we deserve. Um, if you're watching the YouTube version, hit subscribe and click the bell to make sure you get updates on all new content. And um, yeah, share this if it's something that you feel like you think other people might enjoy. Comment if you have something to add to the conversation. And as always, I appreciate all the support people give me. The show is going really, we're, you know, we're at episode 11 or 12 now and it's going really good. I'm really happy with it with the uh how how with with the listener base that we've built so far and it just keeps building every week so i won't keep you anymore you can check out john right on the other side of the jump Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Mike Fisher and today's guest is the one and only John Spanky Stokes from SpankyStokes.com. What's up, John? How are you? Hey, what's going on, man? Doing good. (laughs) Do you prefer to go by John or Spanky or does it matter? You can call me whatever. My dad calls me Spanky, so you can call me Spanky. Is that where the nickname comes from? Is from your family? It actually came from um, my football coach in high school. He said I look like Spanky. Spanky from the Little Rascals, <laughs> and it stuck, dude. It, it it traveled with me from high school to college to my professional career. So, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, John Spanky Stokes is um, known in the um, designer toy uh, industry as one of the top websites for um, you know announcements about releases and such like that. And the the way that me and Spanky became um, acquainted is uh, about four or five years ago, um, Frank Kozik's to- uh, toy company, Happy Plastics, um, did a release of, uh, of a resin sculpture um, line that I did. And he- Frank was like, hey, sent, you know, let Spanky know. He'll totally put it on his site and he has a huge fan base. And then from then on, <laughs> me and Spanky have been in contact, uh, making each other laugh on <laughs> social media all the time. <laughs> yes. Lots of memes, lots of memes. And <laughs> Meme City. How long have you had that web- website up, spankystokes.com? Um, I started it in 2008. Oh, wow. So it's been a minute. Yeah. So what was that, 12 years now? Yeah. yeah. Wow. And uh, is uh, assuming that your your uh, Instagram and all that is also at Spanky Stokes? Spanky Stokes. Just search it. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Everywhere. Um, and then you have your own, you have a couple of your own figures out. If, if, if you want to hold them up, you can totally do that. Um, oh yeah. So, well, I'll show you this guy. This, this is, uh, my little stroll. This is Safubi. Awesome. This is produced by, um, Safubi is, is vinyl, uh, produced in Japan. Okay. So that's a specific type of, um, I guess the process it has to be made in Japan. Um, my stroll is, uh, kind of my mascot for my my website that kind of morphed into its own little figure this is a stroll dunny through kid robot awesome yeah and stroll actually came from um my father i was i was making custom toys for a little bit and uh, all the monsters that i was making all had like these like hair and fur and they kind of look like trolls like the trolls figure my dad had a a dream one night that he called them a stroll, which was a Stokes troll. My last name Stokes troll. And I was like, yeah, that's cool. So like the next figure I made, um, for a show, I like 
named it a stroll and it just kind of stuck and i kind of have i just hit the microphone i'm sorry no it's totally fine dude <laughs> talk with my hands i'm not italian <laughs> but you know i, I do the um, same thing yeah but uh yeah it just kind of morphed into something i've been doing um and using for not only my website but as the figure and stuff so kind of wanted it to be a, a like a face for the designer toy scene kind of that's what i was going for yeah, I, I really love that. That's such a great design. Um, I see on your Instagram that you have people who do like collaborations where somebody does yeah. like 50%. Yeah, I want, I want in on that. I want to, I would yeah. like to do one of those to use as an advertisement for when I actually um, run this episode. I think that would be a cool cross tie in for both of us. That would be fun. Yeah, for sure. And then uh, one of the things that I've been, um, working on with this podcast and the YouTube channel is actually capturing my, um, my Cintiq while I actually draw. So maybe I'll just capture the whole thing as like a, a speed draw video. And that's something that I can send to you and maybe we'll do something with that. Perfect. <laughs> um, I like that idea. So you're super involved in the, um, designer toy scene. And then by day you are a graphic designer for a casino, I guess I understand. Yeah, I've been there for um, 14 years now, although I'm, I mean, while this is recording, I'm furloughed. <laughs> right. So ho hopefully I can go back to, to the job because I love it there. Um, You're down in yeah, the San just, Diego area? Yeah, down in San Diego. Uh, golly, we, we do everything. We do matchbooks and bus wraps and billboards and um, posters and backlits and anything that has the, the casino on it, we, we design. So nice. it's like I, I'm um, very proficient in moving images around on the screen. I'm not an illustrator, <laughs> but I can I can definitely manipulate images. <laughs> yeah, so. that, that's awesome. Like I, I always love that when when you end up you know doing something that you can actually see in the real world, like out doing its job. Um, I'm in a weird position where a lot of times I just do things and they get sent off, and I may never ever see it again. Like if it's a shirt for a particular band. I mean, ever, ever get to see that shirt. And then sometimes I'll be out and I'll see something I did in the wild and I'll be like, Oh my God, I told Whoa, you. I yeah. did. So there must be some level of gratification as a designer, just to, just to be of service in a way that allows the thing you make to do its job and you get to see it. And that, that's, I mean, I can totally get with that. Yeah, it's fun. It's uh it's, um, Man, I, I never in a million years thought I would be working for a casino as a designer. Like it's just and and the casino I work for, it's um, in my hometown where I grew up and oh, wow. um, I played football with like a lot of the tribal dudes like it, that I that I played football with and went to high school with. And um, just it never would have crossed my mind that I'd be working for them, you know, so it's just it's cool. Did you ever work uh in, as a designer, did you ever work anywhere else in any other part of the design field, or was this kind of just where you started out of college? It, right out of college, um, I did an internship, an unpaid internship for um, a small little um, company. I don't even know if they're still open. They're called Orange Couch Design House. Um, I, so I went in there and I was just doing just you know things that as a designer you start out doing like little small ads <laughs> or business cards or uh, you know postcards, pamphlets, things like that. Sure. And then, um, and then I, I, during the time while I was doing the internship, I went and just started applying everywhere, just trying to find a, a paying gig. Cause I was sure. living at home with my parents and just want, you know, I wanted to get out of there. Um, <laughs> so I applied to so many places and, uh, did a, ended up sticking at the, the casino. They hired me and the rest is history. That's, Awesome, man. I, I, I like when I hear, um, creative people who, um, ended up in a job that they actually like to do instead of ending up in the, the first thing they could find that actually, you know, to just to try to make some money because I think people get stuck in that a little bit. I mean, I did a little bit too in the video game industry is, I, I, you know, anybody who listens to this show knows that I'm, I'm a, I went to school for animation and way, way back before it was done on computers. And so, uh, I just figured it was a, a way for me to be able to work with my animation, uh, experience in the video game industry. And then I got into the video game industry and I was there for about 15 years, but it was never satisfying for, for me personally, cause I'm not a huge gamer. Um, 
but it was, you know, it afforded me a fantastic life to raise my family back when I was in it. So I don't have any ill will towards it, but it was just, it was really a way for me to make money. Cause what I really wanted to do was, you know, make, you know, rock posters and album covers and stuff like that. So I just did all that on my, on the side until, you know, I finally got to the point where I had enough business that I could, uh, I could leave my day job and you know, I've been doing this for like the last 10 years, but like you, I'm furloughed. I'm just furloughed from, from the freelance world. <laughs> Nobody's giving me work right now. So yeah, it's a weird situation right now. It Everybody's really in is. it. Is your wife um, working or is she also at, at home furloughed with, with, from her job? She has, um, since we had our child, she's been a stay at home mom. Oh, so okay. yeah. A, a, what do they call it? A domestic uh, work <laughs> something. I, I forget the, the PC term for it. But yeah. <laughs> right. No, she's been, she's been an awesome, uh, mother to our child. And right now it's like even more so cause I mean, she's her teacher now too, cause wow, they right. can't go to school. And my daughter's in kindergarten, which isn't like too crazy when it comes to school learning wise, but, um, I, you know, hats off to her. I, it's, it, she's been awesome. So you guys are all home alone. In, in the All same house alone. together. That I, I, that as a as a working person, I'm that has to have uh, that has to have its merits, you know, just to be able to have time with your your wife and kid, you know, without the busy life of go to work, come home, go to work, come home. So I know that's kind of where I've been with it. Is you know my work, my wife works in in Hollywood production, and so you know they'll she when she's on a TV show or a movie, I might not see her, but an hour a day for months at a time. So it's been really nice to have her around, you know, every right. day. It's actually like hanging out with my wife, you know, as much as I like hanging out with anybody. So it's, it's kind of been a blessing in that way. A hundred percent. Yeah, it totally is. And it, it's kind of nice too. Um, she still, she knows I still do like the website stuff. Um, so that's like a second job kind of freelance whenever I get extra time. So she still gives me that extra time I still need to to come in to the office and just bang some posts out or, you know, work on some other things here and there. Um, and while she's like teaching my daughter. So it's, it, it's been working out pretty good. That's great. That's great to good, hear. Good balance. <clears throat> That's good to hear. I always like to hear people doing well in tough situations. Yeah. Um, so in regards to the, um, the toy industry, um, I know I have, I have limited, um, interaction with it i did one piece for um jamungo in the blow up dolls uh series and it, it like i said i told you in the pre-interview it really wasn't any good at all it was like in a weird time in my life where i just wasn't inspired to do much and i got this opportunity and i did not make the most of it but um i know the whole the whole toy the the designer toy thing was like a it was really big in the mid to late 2000s is it still stayed is it still an industry that people care about? Is it still producing, you know? I Yeah, I mean, I would say so. I mean, I wake up every day and there's new emails in my inbox saying, hey, can you help me promote this? Can you post this for me? Um, it's, it's, it's just a weird situation because, like you said, it was huge. Kind of when I started to get into it, it was like 2006, 2007. That was like really, it was, it was on the up, uphill curve right there. Um, and it kind of petered out around 2012, 2013, kind of plateaued and started to go down again. But um, I would say it's not how it was because so many retail locations have closed. Um, uh, I, I think just the whole brick and mortar for this type of industry, it doesn't work. Right. It did for some reason. I, I You know, because Kid Robot, they used to have lines around the block for releases. Yeah. And it was just, it, it was wild. Monkey King, <laughs> I would go to LA um, on Melrose and Monkey King and Kid Robot, they would do like dunny releases or figure releases. And, you know, you would wait in line and go all the way around the block to get in there just to get nurse to sign it. And it's, it's not like that anymore. Wow. So obviously it's changed, you know, a little bit. <laughs> Everything's changed, especially when it comes to retail. It's like, if you can get it online, like why go stay, stand in a line? You know, I think that that's just, I think that that is the future. That's been the future of retail for a long time is it's just all going online. And I think with this, with this, um, lockdown, I, yeah, I think it's going to even be more of that. You know, it's going to be weird. It's the world's going to be weird when this is over. It's going to be a lot different than people ex have been used to, I think. But, um, I know that. Yeah. Cause I remember, um, 
whenever Kozik had something at like Golden Apple or, or Kid Robot when they had their location, I would always make a point to go down to say hi to him. And it was, I was always like, God damn, there's a lot of motherfuckers waiting to get their <laughs> toys right now. Yeah. That's yeah, it was it was it was rock star status for all those artists, man. They were, you know, they were flying them around the globe, going over to China, doing signings, things like that. Um, conventions, releases. Um, it was it was crazy. And now, you know, like we talked it, this whole scene is evolving into there's no conventions this year. So all all these artists that rely on these conventions to do these releases and things like that, it's all going to be online. You know, San Diego Comic Con, the biggest pop culture convention, is not happening this year. Right, and it didn't even get postponed; it like got canceled. <laughs> Jesus so Christ. all those all those people who rely on that stuff for income, they gotta you know adapt. They they have to adapt to this, and I think that's where all e commerce comes into place. You know, promote your sales, promote your brand through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever you need to do to say, hey. Even though San Diego Comic Con is not happening this year, we have San Diego Comic Con exclusives available <laughs> through our website. So can you right. come you know, buy them here? So it's it's just a, a weird thing. Um, I think a lot of people have been kind of used to that, though, in the past, what, five, ten years for Am- like Amazon. Like who goes to the store anymore to buy stuff? Right. If you can just click and buy, you get stuff delivered to you. So I, I think it's becoming more common for people to do that. Yeah. And now that we're forced to do it, it's like, (laughs) you know, right. So dude, I totally, totally get that. Um, I, you know, that made me think of designer con and, um, I actually went to designer con when it was like, cross my fingers. That still happens, dude. I I love that convention. I, I went in the first year or two. Maybe it was the second year I went when it was still up in Glendale. Cause it was a short way from where I was living at the time. And, um, it was small. It was small. I I just, I just went to say hi to Frank and, um, and like cruise around and see what else was going on. Cause I was, I was in the middle of getting my, that first pyramid sculpture together. And I was trying to figure out if this was an Avenue, um, I was going to, you know, spend some time trying to get involved with. (laughs) And so, uh, I was like, wow, this is super, super cool. And then I, I, you know, me and my wife talk is like, yeah, we should go back next year. Maybe I should try to get a table and sell some art. And, um, and then, you know, I didn't, and then I didn't. And then, and then they moved it to Anaheim and it's gotten so big now. I could have never, ever imagined it would get that big. No. And, and we all, all of, all the OG people that, you know, used to go to the, the, the smaller designer con or actually it was, uh, um, what the heck was it called before? It wasn't called Designer Con. It was called uh, Vinyl Toy Network. Is in the first like four or five years they did it. It was Vinyl oh, wow. Toy Network, um, and it was in that one, one little room inside the Pasadena Convention Center, yeah, Pasadena, and it was super small. And and we loved that that vibe. And then, like you said, it just continued to grow and grow and grow. And finally, um, two years ago, three years ago, they just outgrew Pasadena, and yeah. they're like, okay, well, let's move to Anaheim. And since they moved to Anaheim, it's like every year since then, it's just got bigger and bigger. So it's crazy. <laughs> it's not it's like crazy. it was. We a lot of us really dug that that old, you know, vibe of of how close knit the community was. And now it's like a full on convention, which is I mean, it's good. It's good exposure for a lot of artists that wouldn't get that because of the designer toy scene is very niche. So it's sure. like not it's it's not all out there. Whereas if you get um, San Diego Comic Con. Um, a lot of people would go there for the comics or the um, uh, TV shows or movies, Marvel, you know, all that stuff. And they would maybe see, you know, um, a kid robot figure and be like, oh, that's really cool. What is that? So I think Designer Toy Network or um, um, what did I just say? <laughs> Designer Toy Network? What is that? Is that what the show uh, used I'm, to be called before it was called Designer Con? Designer Con. Thank you. I'm yeah. totally <laughs> um, I think it's cool that people will go out to that now and, and be exposed to all these artists that, you know, they would never even hear about. So it's cool. Yeah, I think um, I, I have literally never been to Comic-Con and everybody who 
you know, as an illustrator, as a person who's an illustrator, people are always like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And <laughs> I think one of the things was initially it was a comic book convention and I have very low, low interest in comics in general. I like, you know, I really love a lot of uh, comic books um, from just a visual standpoint. I was just never a collector. Like I love the Jeff Darrow stuff, hard boiled and all that stuff because the drawings are just super amazing. I'm just not really so good. Not really a superhero comic guy and I didn't grow up on it so it isn't something I can even look back on in a nostalgic way I totally appreciate it and I love that people anything that makes people love any kind of art is totally fine by me so if comic books um, are how you re relate to the world of art I'm never gonna I'm never gonna hate on that so for some reason I just never went down to comic-con um, and then it kind of just became less and less about comics from what I understand. And it was based a place to, for everybody to promote their new superhero movies or their new sci-fi movies. And, and, and that yeah. even though I'd never been a part of it, it, that seemed a little cheap to me. And, and then when I went to designer con, I was like, Oh, this is like just artists showing art. And, um, it wasn't even necessarily just about the toys. Uh, I, I, I found once I got there and I don't know how it is now, but it seems like it's still just like a place that if you are an illustrator and you have stuff to sell, this is a place you can get a table and go do that. And that's what people go there to look for, not for movie trailers or whatever, but to buy art from artists who make art. A hundred percent. And I hope it stays that way. I mean, they could definitely be like, Hey, you know, Marvel, you want to come in here possibly? Or, you <laughs> it's know, only a matter biggest... of time. <laughs> I, and, and if they do that, you know, I'm all about growth. It started out small and, and good for them, you know, right. but um, it's it's cool that, like you said, if you're just an illustrator, if you make posters, whatever, like you could possibly still get a table there and, and you know, get seen by people that would never see your work. Yeah, so that's cool. Yeah, that's super cool. I, I, I love that. And now and it makes me want to start going back again. So hopefully <laughs> when this is all over, uh, we able to do that. I, I had uh, tickets to go to. Um, psycho las vegas um like the doom metal festival in vegas and i just got uh the notice that it had been postponed until 2021 and i got the the, the hotel cancellation i was like no uh, it was like my one vacation uh, a year <laughs> you did that you did that last year right not last year year before last year i did punk rock bowling because one of the okay. record labels that i work for slope records um that i kind of do a lot of their design work um they had a booth and so I was like, you know what, this is probably good business to go out and hang out with them. And I'd never been to the punk rock bowling festival before, which is also weird. Um, and that was really fun. We, me and my wife had a really good time. She's not super into punk music. Um, she doesn't not like it, but it's, she didn't grow up on it. Like, like guys like me and you did. Um, sure. and, but she, you know, she, she knows she can recognize the real deal when she sees it. So there were bands like, you know, we, we were standing there watching the refused and she was like, Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> that's Good what music. The, that's the real thing. And the same thing yeah. with the hives. She was like, I don't know the you know, I know some of their songs. And then she saw them live and she's like, Holy shit. And I was like, Well, yeah, this is this is what my life has been about. Cause I saw this shit when I was twelve years old and it never left me. It became my reason to exist is to live right. in that world, you know, where mm -hmm. where this is you could go out on a Friday or a Saturday night and see bands this good in some shitty you know you know elks lodge in the suburbs you know like five bands for, for five sure. bucks do this shit and it's like yeah i think it brought it it gave her a better perspective of a perspective of how i have managed to stay so into all that stuff for as long as i have for sure man because i know you Music came up in the punk rock scene too yeah yeah um you know i wasn't like really like I guess crusty punk, you know, like, <laughs> right. so it, it, cause my parents, they wouldn't let me, you know, do my hair all crazy and very conservative home, but sure. they still allowed me to, to listen to stuff that, um, they normally wouldn't listen to at all. So, um, yeah, I would, I would go San Diego had a pretty cool punk scene back in the, uh, early nineties where, uh, in my hometown next town to me there was this little place called soul kitchen it was in this town called el cajon uh -huh. and there are all these punk bands that used to play a little hole in the wall place and every thursday night they would do something and my parents would let me go even on school night you know they would let me go this is during high school 
Um, and then Saturday was always a good show at Soma. I don't know if you heard of Soma yeah. in San Diego. Yeah. They've moved multiple times. I don't even know where they are anymore. It's been so long since I've been to a show. But um, I used to go to Soma every Saturday night with a group of friends and just see whoever was playing. It didn't really matter. It was always a punk show. Just so, didn't, It never mattered. It never mattered nope. back in the day. It was like, I'm just going to go see whoever it is. Because you were bound to, even if you had never heard of a particular band, you're bound to like them anyway. You know? Exactly. exactly. Yeah, I think uh, with my last band, um, we did a show at Brick by Brick. Um, and that might okay, be yeah, there in San Diego. one of my few experiences with playing live in San Diego. Yep. Yeah. It's a, that's a cool little venue. Yeah. 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 It was a fun one. Um, we, we, the band that I was in, all of the members had come from like larger, more established bands. And so it was kind of just a side project for everybody. Um, they were all death metal and grindcore guys and they wanted to play punk music. And so. Um, we started that and then we would always end up playing with with death metal bands because the members, you know, we were able to just through connections, get shows with that. And it was always an interesting, you know, we did one show one time that we just we called it Incest Fest, where every single band had to have had a member who was in one of the other bands on the bill. So it was just uh. like six bands worth of bands that were, were all friends who had been in each other's bands. That was really super fun. And some guys ended up having to play like two sets that night because they were That's in two cool, bands though. at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it was a good one. Yeah, I've never heard heard of a, a thing like that. I know some some play um, people in bands do that. They you know have two or three bands that they constantly play with. But yeah, that's cool. Especially drummers because drummers are so rare. They end up having to be in more than one band. Yeah. Um, one of the things I always thought was cool is like in in the in the kind of crustier scene um, when my last band was on tour, we would we would end up playing at these like at, you know like punk houses and squats and stuff, and then sometimes they would have two bands set up at the same time and they'd take turns playing songs. That was always an interesting like rotate setup. like one after another. another? Yeah, one band would play really? a song and they'd stop, and then the other band who set up across the room would play a song. It was that was always it, they were they were kind of called versus shows where it was okay so and so versus so and so, and they just play songs back and forth. And I thought that was super fun. Yeah, so um, the crowd would just turn around, just about yeah, face, it, and go to the, the other crowd side. was just in the middle, and it was like you know the mosh pit in the middle, and you just kind of turn around and look at the other band when it was time to go. Right on. That's actually fun. <laughs> yeah, it was super fun. Those were always like some of the most fun shows to play. Yeah. Um, so some of the other stuff, I'm, I, whenever I, I have a guest come on, I always send them a sheet of paper that's like, what, what kind of other stuff are you into? And um, I know you played football growing up and you actually went to school on a football scholarship. Yep. That's, yeah, that was uh, pretty wild. And it, like I said in that little thing – I feel like I'm I'm the dichotomy of of just I'm a mishmash of I'm a, I'm a nerd I play football I do art <laughs> I like to go hunting like I, I I don't know it's just I the whole art thing with the whole football thing it just I was the only one in in art school that you know did sports so like where a lot of teachers would give um, a lot of lenience to uh, athletes in college you know in terms of um, uh, projects and things like that. The archers were like, I, I don't care if you have a full, football game on Saturday, you know, you <laughs> right. need to, you need to get this project in. So that was, that was interesting. Um, it was a struggle that nobody else, cause a lot of my football buddies, they would do like, um, community relations was their was their, mm -hmm. uh, bachelor's degree. And like, sure. they, you didn't really have to do anything. So, um, it was, it was an interesting, uh, thing growing up and, and doing that and, and having the whole art thing going on too. Yeah. But yeah. I went to school up in Humboldt, which was pretty wild. Yeah. You my know? I have a cousin uh, who was just a few years older than me who went to Humboldt. And then afterwards he became a county sheriff. He was a county sheriff up in Humboldt before he transferred to CHP and, you know, came back down to the Bay Area. But so I have a little familiar familiarity with that, with that school. And my daughter, actually my daughter's childhood best friend went to school up there as well. Okay. So yeah, yeah. I know a little bit about Humboldt. <laughs> Places. It's a whole nother world. And I'm sure I haven't been there for a long time. I actually met my, my wife when I was going to school there. Um, but it's a whole nother world. I would have never thought that you know, the, the path that, that life take that life takes you. It's just, it's, it's so weird. It's so weird. And, <laughs> and Humboldt is, is that weird spot. It 
just in my right. life that I would never, I would never um, take it back because I loved it. But it was just, just looking back on the experiences and just the people and the, the location. It was just, you know, it was cool. It was really cool, but super odd. Yeah. Anybody who wants to know a little bit about Humboldt can watch that uh, the Netflix series um, Murder Mountain. Murder Mountain. And it's yep. just about that Humboldt County and like how for generations almost it's been um, about uh, marijuana production when it was illegal all the way up to the struggle of it turning legal and how that changes and in the, in the culture of an entire county, like a big county oh, up there. The uh, I, I told my wife, I was like, you know what? If I could find a job up here, I would stay because it's beautiful. I mean, it's literally God's country with the, the trees and just it's green year round. And it's just so it's so beautiful. And you're right next to the beach and the ocean. And it's just untouched. Um, but there's no economy unless you're one, a logger. And you you work for a logging company or two a, a pot farmer, and that right. those are the only two economies up there. Everything yeah. else just kind of floats around up there, you know. Just it it's like that's why it's so weird. <laughs> right. It's it's a it's a it's a place lost in time. It really is. Yeah, I I had a kid who worked for me in the game industry whose family was from up that way, and uh, the, you know, his parents were uh were from Los Angeles. And when, once they had kids, they were like, well, we don't want to raise our kids in LA because they were hippies, you know, from like the, the late sixties, early seventies. And they're like, we're moving to Humboldt. And so he grew up up there and he was like, yeah, man, he's like, he went, he, he was a wrestler and he had, ended up going to ASU on a wrestling um, scholarship. Oh, okay. um, and yeah, he, he, he was like, yeah, it's fucking weird up there, man. <laughs> yes, it is. And and since I graduated, they they cut the football program, so there's no more football up there, oh. which which really sucks. Um, was it a pretty high level program? It was Division two, um, and there wasn't a lot of money. So if we traveled places, we took the bus and we traveled to like Montana. Oh, so shit. like riding on a bus, dude. This was like the crazy. We we hopped on the bus Thursday night. It took us basically 27 hours to drive there on a bus because the bus had to stop they had to like switch drivers and things like that mm -hmm. um we got off the bus saturday morning um got on the field played our game after we lost <laughs> we got back on the bus and and bus back and got there got back to Humboldt like monday morning it was just and, and we were all banged up and busted <laughs> sure. i mean Oh, dude, it was just, it was so brutal. Where all these other teams, like D1 schools, hey, let's go on a flight. You know, we'll fly you this place, whatever. Dude, we were, we were like the, uh, <laughs> the bad news bears of the, the football world. You, yeah, I, was pretty I, bad. I've been along on that ride in the hockey world a little bit. Um, when I was trying to figure out if I could, uh, pl uh, play minor league hockey, and it's not unlike that in a lot of ways. Let me, t <laughs> let me tell you. And, and that's a similar situation where, uh, for me where, um, I played really high level hockey and, but I, I'm not a jock. I don't care about sports at all. A lot like you where it's like, dude, this same. Is I don't care right now. Like I, dude, I haven't watched football. I haven't done any, like whatever. Like I, I just, I love playing. Right. I like playing goalie. And so we have, we've talked about that before online about that. The thing that we have in common is that we're both we both have managed to become high level athletes without having any interest in sports in general, which 100%. is hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I think that's how we had, a, had our first kinship about, uh, about right. things. Right. Yep. Um, uh, one of my other favorite things that you put on your sheet is that you, um, grew up playing Dungeons and Dragons. Love, love the, just the whole fantasy realm and, I, I got into it from some mm -hmm. friends in high school, football buddies. Once again, um, we would all just get together, play Dungeons and Dragons Friday night after school was out. Do we would get hungry? Howie's pizza, <laughs> have my mom buy like five, two liter bottles of Mountain Dew and just stay up, you know, all <laughs> night long and just play. It was great. That and Magic the Gathering. That's I nerded amazing. out big time. That's amazing. I've talked about um, before my mentor in the video game industry, um, kind of left the game industry, moved back to England, and he does he does art for magic cards, 
and you know, oh. war, uh, like Warhammer stuff and like all the books and all the games that are associated with, um, you know, card games and tabletop gaming. And he's, he's an, an incredible illustrator. Like you gotta be some of that stuff is just mind blowing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's on a level of skill that I'm just honored to be able to say that I worked for the guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if I have right? any skill at painting at all, it's, it's only because I, I got just a tiny hair of the skill that that dude had just watching him work was absolutely amazing to me. And, um, shout out to James Ryman and I will, I'll, I'll, I'll post, I'll, I'll put up a little, um, picture of one of his pieces. Uh, so people on the YouTube channel can see it. And if you are listening to the podcast version, just do a Google search for James Ryman and look at his work. Cause he, it's mind blowing stuff. Nice. I'll have to look that up too. Yeah. Per personally, I played D and D a little bit when I was growing up and it was one of those things that I wanted to do and I couldn't find anybody else who would stay interested ah. for longer than five minutes. Um, cause I was, you know, it had so much cool art around it that there was no chance for me to not at least be at, at least peripherally images uh, interested just because there were books full of drawings about monsters. And when I was a little kid, all I cared about was monsters. And so, you know, it just caught my attention. I just could never find anybody to really play with. Um, and then, you know, when I, when I got into the game industry, there were other people who would play regular, but by that time I was so busy raising my kids. I just didn't have time really sure. to get involved. But, um, I love that in this current modern age that it's no longer a nerd thing like D and D is like almost a mainstream activity now. Like it's, I I'd, I'd imagine it's gotta be as mainstream as it's ever been. Maybe more so you hear about people having DVD D and D parties all the time, you know? Yeah, I agree. I think it's totally cool. Um, and I think that's a, a lot of thing that's lacking with, with kids growing up nowadays is imagination. And that was one of the things that I, I think really caught my attention with Dungeons and Dragons is, I mean, you get like five or six guys together around a table. You have one dude, the dungeon master, who basically sets the plot, sets the story, the mood for all of you. And you guys just kind of collectively live this little dream out with each other and, and you know, take on a, an alternate personality. I guess it's you can kind of do that stuff with some of these video games like Sims and things like that where sure. you live another life. Um but it's just it's something fun about getting together with some buddies and doing it around a table and you know in between the 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 journey or the story you're doing you know you're BSing about other stuff whatever so yeah it, it's so much fun camaraderie you know I think that's another reason that I like sports is you know the camaraderie you get with you know a group of people kind of the same thing with a scene that you're involved with you know the designer toy scene you you have a camaraderie with uh, artists and the collectors and things like that. So, right. Yeah. I, I definitely got a lot of that, um, out of the, the rock poster scene. I, I have friends that, I you know, that I consider to be my best friends that I, that I know through that, who don't even live in the same town as me. I mean, you know, it's like just people that I've known online forever and you get to see them once or twice every few years. And, you know, I, you know, I, I totally get it. Um, it was, it was a little harder for me with sports. Like I, I'm not a team person, uh, so it's hard for me even now as an adult when I still play, it's like, it's kind of hard to get much more than a superficial, um, friendship going with most of the guys I play with, but I definitely have at least two or three people that I met through playing hockey as an adult who, you know, they're like my, my closest friends. And so I, I can't say that that's not totally true. Um, well, I think sure. for me, one of the things that I always really liked also about D and D, and this was a thing that I got to experience a little bit when I first got into the game industry. Um, I had a little, I had about six months where I was on contract in Los Angeles before my wife and kids moved down my wife at the time. And, um, so I would, I didn't have a lot to do. So I would go hang out with the other guys in the, you know, who worked, who I worked with and they would, you know, they'd have nights where they were playing. I, the one that they, they didn't play straight D and D. They would find other different games. I think one of the ones that they played was gamma world. 
and it was a little more mm. post-apocalyptic, you know, type okay. of thing. And so I'd go hang out and drink beer with them and do that. And every time they started and they were rolling up new characters, I'd just roll up a new character because I was there and it'd give me a, a, an excuse to draw out my character once he was all done. And I always, that, that was always super fun. Like watching them come up with their characters and then draw the character. And they were all really funny guys. And so it was, it wasn't, it was almost like it was an exercise in how can I be funny enough to make everybody laugh, you know, with my character's <laughs> absurdity and the drawing that goes with it. Um, sure, sure. I always loved that. That was always really fun just just to hang out and do that. And then once they started campaigning, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'll just hang back and drink some beers, whatever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, did you get into like painting miniatures and all that? I did. I, and now that I think about it, um, I feel like doing those kind of set the bar for me doing the custom designer toys later on. Um, we would have, you know, if we weren't doing a campaign, we would have a paint party and do the same thing. Get some Hungry Howie's pizza, some Mountain Dew and just paint miniatures, <laughs> you know, and that was fun. And those things are so small, man. But the detail that I feel like I wish I had them still, I could look back but I remember them being so detailed and so cool. And I wish I still had some of mine. Um, some of my buddies might actually have some of mine that I painted, but I don't know where they all went. Yeah, that's awesome. I, even though I didn't play, um, I, there was a, there was a game shop in the mall that mostly, you know, had like chess games and like grown up stuff, but they also carried the little lead figures. And I would, you know, when I was like into heavy metal, and you know, when I was like 16, I would go in there and buy all these like demons and monsters and take them home and paint them. And I was like super into it. And then um, one of my oldest son, uh, when I, I'm, you know, early 2000s uh, started playing um, Warhammer 40K, which is a tabletop um, miniatures game. And yep. so then came lots and lots of painting of miniatures because you had to do a whole army. It wasn't one character. Yeah. It was like, we got a whole squad here to do. And we'd sit down. And it was cool because it was something I could do with him, you know, like where it was a hands-on father and son type of thing. And I always, of course. I always really liked that. And, and I, and you know, from the heavy metal scene, the band Bolt Thrower uses all the games workshop art as their, you know, inspiration and actually uses it as some of their album art. And so it was, I was already familiar with the, you know, the, the, the space Marines and all that. So I, mm -hmm. it was an easy, it was an easy buy-in for me as a father to be like, oh yeah, I'm familiar with this thing. And, you know, let's, let's fucking do it, you know? And mm -hmm. because I was in the game industry, all I had to do was send out a mass email to um, everybody at the company that I worked at and all of my friends saying, my son started playing Warhammer 40K. If you have any old stuff that you have in a box somewhere, I would be happy to take it off your hands. Score. And so we got inundated with just tons, tanks and dreadnoughts and like all these armies and figures. And like, I started bringing stuff home, you know, like over the course of a couple of weeks and like every day he's like waiting out front, like, I'd get out of the truck and I'd have like this box full of like painted figures or half painted figures. He's like, yes, I'm going to destroy, <laughs> gonna destroy all of my friends. And there was a yeah. place around the corner that actually um, hosted games. And so, you know, he'd go, to, we'd go over there on a Saturday and, you know, we'd get in on it and stuff like that. And that kind of re just reminded me that um, before I moved back out here to the suburbs um, in the San Fernando Valley, I lived down by Dodger stadium and, um, right around the corner from us as it was it was traditionally a very impoverished um latino neighborhood forever echo park was and um and then it started to get hipsterized um pretty quick yes. and um uh, gentrified if you will if you if we want to if, you exactly. want, if you're looking for a word um, there you go and so right around the corner um, they put in a brand new fancy um, craft beer place which was actually really awesome and uh, a friend of mine actually runs that place and it was one of those places where anytime someone came into town, whether they were a band that were friends of mine or like family, you just took them to this place. And every single person was like, I've never seen a, a beer place with a bigger, better selection of beer anywhere, anywhere ever. And so it was that kind of place. And then like two doors down, there was a pizza place. And then right next to that, they put in a gaming um, location where you could just rent table time and play D and D or you could, you know, play Warhammer, whatever your tabletop game was or magic or any of those. And, um, 
I thought that was really cool. I mean, it was the it was the symbol of gentrification when you can put in a, right? a gaming place like that. But last time I was through there, you know, a few years ago, it was still there. It was still thriving. So, I mean, God bless them, I guess. Yeah, good for them. That's awesome. Yeah, that whole neighborhood's changed so much. It was all taquerias and, you know, um, you know, Mexican uh, medicinal, uh, <laughs> you know, herb places. And now it's, you know high-end coffee shops and it, it lost its flavor and we, we figured if we were going to buy a house we might as well move out to the burbs there you go and uh yeah so yeah i i, I get I, I totally get like the D D and all that gaming stuff and 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 your um correlation of that to um to your to the toy industry is actually that's a really good um line to draw because for me in the the initial part of my uh, being exposed to the toy industry, it was that people bought blanks and customized them. Yep. You know, that was a thing that people did. And it's essentially the exact same thing. Exactly. Except with, with the, you know, the, the pewter miniatures for the Dungeons and Dragons, things like that, where all the details are already on there, the blank figure, it kind of is a blank canvas and, and lets you kind of reimagine it. You can sculpt on it, um, paint it directly, just whatever. Um, it's really cool. The, the whole creative aspect of the whole designer toy scene um and that's kind of where it's moving to or i should say has moved a lot of the people that started out customizing have gone on to you know start up a, their own company or do their own um resin figures vinyl figures um it's no longer you have to be a big company you know like kid robot or um super seven or strange co if you if you really want it seems like the the resources are there for you to go out do the research. You can make your own toys. Is which your is, cool. is your um, stroll? Is that through another company or is that all you? Um, no, I've um, you know I've I've had the, uh, the 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 I've been very fortunate to to team up with other companies like like this guy right here through through Toy Art Gallery. Um, you know I I I went and talked to Gino, the owner. This was six, seven years ago and said, you know, I have my stroll figure. Would that be something interested? And he was like, yeah, that, that would be really cool. Um, and they produced it for me. You know, they, they put the money towards the molds and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and in terms of like a partnership, I get, uh, one of the figures they produce, I, I don't get money for it, which is, which is fine by me. Cause they put all the money into it. Um, and as long as I get, you know, a physical, like I, I just, I love having my own figure, <laughs> right? I have it, you know, which is really cool to me. I don't, I don't need money for each one that sells or whatever. I think it's just really cool that it got produced. Right. Um, with Kid Robot, the, the, that came later. Um, I went through two different creative directors with Kid Robot before Frank took over and Frank made it happen. Um, so that was super cool. I mean, to have my own Dunny, that's kind of every artist's dream. Sure. Absolutely. I, I, I've been doing a little bit of work for Kid Robot that I can't really talk about, but, um, so I totally get where you're coming from. And, and, and as such, I've talked to Frank a little bit about maybe doing one and he told me to send over designs and I would just been too busy to really sink my teeth into that a lot. But, um, my, my pyramid resin figure, um, which was how me and you became associated. Um, and then I did a second one. That's like the coffin figure, um, the coffin mm -hmm. teeth. And I just, the other day, uh, recorded in a podcast version with the guy who sculpted those for me and actually did the first mold and run of the pyramids before Frank took it over. Um, we're about to start on a new resin mm -hmm. piece for me. And I'm just, um, he's like, dude, I am, I can't go to work cause he, he's a special effects guy and he works in the effects industry. And so all movie and TV productions are on hold right now. So he's like, he's like, I got nothing but time, dude. So, you know, this is what I, I would like to do. And I was like, oh, I, I need to, I just need to sit down and figure out which design I have that sure. I want him to actually spend some time on. But I absolutely have to do that right now because I don't want him waiting on me. Uh, I, if there's anything on this planet earth that I hate is when I make people wait for my, stupid ass to do something i don't ever want to be a burden on anybody <laughs> if i can help it yeah i feel the same way yeah i think that that that's just a testament to um people like us who just you know we've carved out our own path and like 
you know, and like it goes back to that DIY punk rock upbringing where it's like, I'm just not going to wait for anybody to let me do something or tell me I can do something. I'm just going to go do what it is I want to do. And it, and, it, yep. and what comes along with that is, um, not putting a burden on other people, um, yeah. to wait around for you to get it done. So, you know, I think that that's another thing that we really have in common is, is I, I, I know that you work, you you know, you work a full-time job and that's, you know, as, and as a designer in any field, that's a lot of work. Um, I think the thing that I talk about a lot about what we do that people do not understand who don't do it is how hard it is to spend all day, every day coming up with creative ideas. I think that gets glossed over that by the fact that we have a fun job, you know, and it's like, it's, it's exhausting to sit down every single day and come up with a new way to say something. My, um, I would come home from work every day and my wife would be like, man, why, why are you so tired? You just sit at a desk all day long, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And I, I, it's hard to explain that, you know, just the, the mental fortitude it takes to, to just be creative all the time. And, and I mean, a lot of the stuff for the casino, it's it's kind of handed to me, um, and it's very – I don't want to say canned, but we have to come up with a new logo every promotion, and we do new promotions. We do five or six every month, so it's like new logos, new look, new branding for just that one thing, and it's just a, a constant flow of, of promotions and looks, and it can get very taxing. And, <laughs> and, and that's kind of why you know the website spurred – off to the side for me because I I needed something, I guess, else for my creative outlet where it wasn't just, you know, casino work in and out, in and out. Um, the website where it allows me to write because I, I write blog posts. So I, I don't consider myself a writer, but, uh, you know, writing up a blog post, it takes creative juices too and uh, editing photos and things like that. So it's, it's just a constant you know, ebb and flow of creativity all all day long. Yeah. I mean, for me, one of the things that I struggle with in that same area is that, um, like I'll get really bored with, with, um, like a thing that I'm focused on. Like I, you know, with, with my custom painted goalie mask, like I got obsessed with getting good at that. And then after a few few years, I was like, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to find a new challenge. And so it's like, you know, it was like, it was rock posters. And then from rock posters, it was merch design. And then after merch design, it was goalie masks. And now at the moment, I have, I have time to make this podcast. And that's its own entirely different creative endeavor uh, that it, it's given me something to really focus on. You know, I like and it's lear- fun, something new, right? I like learning new skills, man. Like if there's yeah. anything I like, it's like learning new skills. I like to learn something new and I like to teach somebody something maybe they didn't know. Those are like really uh-huh. big things for me. And so this really, really scratches that itch where I can take somebody like you and, and give them some time to talk about something that they're passionate about that maybe somebody else who listens to this podcast doesn't know anything about like, you know, right on. I, I, you know, there's a lot of musicians on here across a lot of different genres of music. And, you know, maybe they don't have much understanding of the, of this, of this toy thing. And so I, I think that, but almost all of them will have some understanding of Dungeons and Dragons. I can promise there you that. There you go. <laughs> so yeah, I, I really love, uh, having the opportunity to learn something new and teach somebody something new, just, you know, the, the, the last guest that I, um, interviewed and I won't put these out in sequence, so it's not going to make any sense to people unless they're a regular listener. Um, he works, he is on the board of a mm, charity. And so okay. it, it's called, um, punk rock saves lives. And it's a charity that finds worthy, um, projects to throw money at whether it's uh cancer um, causes or animal shelters or whatever whatever they deem worthy and so it was really cool to sit here and listen to him talk about it and realize i'm gonna put this out in the world and you know maybe my stupid ramblings will you know maybe it'll be of some good as <laughs> some contribution to humanity via my friend's cool project and you know it was like a weird 
realization, you know, for me to have it when, when I was listening to him and it made me really proud of him as a person. And, you know, and you know, this, there's been so many, so many great surprises about doing this podcast and YouTube channel about, you know, just getting time to spend time to talk to another person in person, because I don't, I'm so trapped in this art studio by myself all the time that I'm far enough away from Los Angeles at this point that it's, you know, with traffic, it's an hour for me to get down there. So I just don't. So I'm here yeah. by myself and, you know, getting a chance to talk to people like you face to face, you know, that it's been really good for my, um, I hate to use the word soul cause that's not the right word, but it's use been it. really it is good. good for your soul. Man. It's been it's good for your being. It's, re it's been very good for my being to spend time talking to people that I, that I like and I find inspirational and then having the realization that I think that these are people that other people are going to feel the same way about when they get a chance to hear about it. Because so far, all of these interviews have just been so good. And when I get off, people are like, when we, when we get finished, people are like, man, that was really, that was really fun. Like, you know, and I wasn't, I wasn't really expecting people to find this to be something that was fun to, for themselves to do, you know? Yeah, no, it is. Uh, I'm enjoying myself. What the heck? It's cool to, to talk to you. You yeah, know, for sure. we've I, never talked in person. It's always been just online. Yeah. So. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and to go back a little bit, what you were saying about writing stuff for your, um, for your blog, y you are very good at, um, writing something that makes people, um, excited about the thing you're talking about. And that, that is a skill. You, you might not consider yourself a writer, but that is definitely a skill. Um, and you should appreciate that about yourself. <laughs> well, and, you know, and, and going back to, you know, you starting this thing and, and promoting, uh, other people's, uh, I don't want to say agendas, but what they do and hopefully inspiring somebody else. That's kind of another reason why I like doing what I do um, with the, the website, um, <clears throat> promoting other people's work to hopefully let the, anybody else out in the world, you know, see it and possibly purchase it gives me a really good feeling like it, it you know, helping somebody out um, indirectly, whether it's sales or um, they see it and they're inspired to make something themselves like that is so cool. <laughs> God, that's and I awesome. love, I love that feeling. Yeah. I mean, and I guess, you know, just on a, on a basic level, you wouldn't do it if you didn't feel that way. And, and so that just means that that's the kind of person you are. And I think if, if you're in this world and, and, and you have that instinct to do something kind of selflessly like that, that can help other people. Uh, that's, you know, that's something that, that should be noted. I think it, I think it's, a, it, that is an admirable trait for anybody to have. So, you know, cheers to use for that. Likewise, buddy. <laughs> um, is there anything else you want to cover, um, before we start heading off, like any other projects you got going on, you want to talk about or, you know, um, well, like you starting the podcast, I kind of started doing something else myself. Um, I, Ever since I had my daughter, she's almost six years old, I was always looking for something to, to do on my phone while I put her to sleep at night. Uh -huh. And I started playing like some some mobile games on my phone and things like that. And I got involved with a few games. And I just I play a lot. And I just started a, a gaming channel on YouTube where I do some streaming and stuff like that. Okay. And we, we started a YouTube channel for my daughter too um, where we do like toy reviews, things like that. It's fun. And um, I'm learning how to stream – some games for her through my iPhone and we, we, we do it together. And I just, we just did one where we played like uh, super Mario on our phone, um, <laughs> on the iPhone version. Um, so, you know, new territory there doing some, some online kind of gaming and streaming. And it, it's just, it's fun to create content. And once again, if somebody sees it and they like it, they want to play that game. I'm all about it. It's, it's fun. What's the name of your channel? On it's uh, spanky Stokes gaming. Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> is it easy to find your daughter's channel from that? Or do you want to shout that out or? Yeah, it's, it's a, a life with Lacey Lee. Um, Excellent. That's her, that's her little channel. She has an Instagram that I, that I maintain and upload videos for her and stuff. So that is super cool, man. I, you didn't give me any information about that on your sheet. So now I'm excited. You just told me something I didn't know about. There you go. There you go. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of keeping the whole gaming thing kind of on the DL, I guess, but, um, I don't, I don't know why, maybe because I want it to, um, kind of like what you're doing, you're, you're doing all these podcasts in a row and you want it to have something, you know, established. 
um, I kind of want to build my channel before I start yeah. promoting it. Does yeah, that makes sense. It. Yeah, I get it. Um, it, it'll be at least a couple of weeks till I put this one out. So you have a little time to do what you need to do before this there we go. the airwaves. Do some more games. Yeah. You know, as I'm sure you're learning, if you're building a YouTube channel, um, building a YouTube channel is its own job and it's its own skill set. That's just, uh, it's been, it's been, it's been a lot of extra, like I'm learning how to make video and audio, but then that's like a whole nother side of it. So luckily yep. with my wife home, she's been like, she saw the first few of these that I've done. And then, and, uh, and I, I did a bunch of test ones and then, you know, she watched those and she's like, Oh yeah, I think, I think you're going to get good at this. And then over the last week I've been doing rough edits of all of the actual episodes that I've been, um, recording and she watches them kind of proof some, um, at night before Ben, she's like, shit, like you're pretty good at this. Maybe we should really make, try to make something out of it. So she's been going to YouTube university on how to make a YouTube channel. Um, nice. so she's like, she kind of taken over a producer role on this whole thing. And it's been right on, it's been a super fun thing that we can do together. Yeah. Right on, dude. That's cool. And, and I had a little experience with the whole YouTube thing because I do toy reviews and unboxings through my Spanky Stokes website. Right. So, I mean, I'm familiar. I do edits with Premiere and upload and things like that and do tags and just, you know, all the thumbnails and all that stuff that goes along with it. <laughs> yeah. So I'm familiar with that. So it was kind of an easy um, segue for me to, to do for my daughter and the gaming thing. But the yeah. whole streaming thing while while I'm playing games and doing that, that's, you know, a, a whole new program I had to learn and things like that, just like you. What did you have a software that you're using to do to do that with? Yeah, it's called Streamlabs. OK, is it like do a screen grab on your device? Yes. Well, uh, Streamlabs allows you to make what they call scenes where you can like um, have like a stream starting soon s screen. And then it transitions to you, you know, on a webcam with the, the camera, the, the game screen on it. Um, how I capture with my phone, it's a, it's a thing called let's view and it allows um, my uh, screen to be captured through um, screen mirroring through an iPhone onto okay. my PC. Okay. okay. Yeah. And the stream labs captures that video onto the thing so yeah because I, I i've been trying to find the right software that i want to use to capture my cintiq so that i can start doing some um some speed drawing stuff to put up on the channel that i you know just to kind check of show out Streamlabs. yeah i will for check sure check out Streamlabs. it's free i will for sure and yeah that kind yeah. of goes back to what we were talking about before where you have your um your stroll collaborations that you do on instagram where you know someone draws the second half of your stroll character and i definitely want to do uh do a, a drawing a capture screen capture drawing of that um something that Love we it. can both use to um promote when i decide to uh put this video up Perfect. <laughs> All right, man. I'm gonna let you go about the rest of your the rest of your life, <laughs> and uh, you know, I know you're coming back to do a movie review, and um, yeah, that one's gonna be uh, that's gonna be a whole nother thing. But uh, <laughs> I I appreciate you coming in, Spanky, and um, I'm looking forward to talking to you again really soon. All right, Mike. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks, man. Take care. See you later.